Greetings and welcome to Poems On. This is the eighth show of the series, and our theme for this show is Poems on Science. I'm Al Basil, and my guests today are Claudia Gary and Rick Mullen. Welcome, folks. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having um, us. So I'm going to invite Claudia to, to read first. And if you'll tell us a little bit about what you're going to read before you do that, that will be helpful. OK. The first poem I'd like to read is from, is from my chapbook, Genetic Revisionism, as are most of them. And this is called A Panpsychist Confides in the Universe. Um, there's an epigraph for this, uh, which goes as follows. The notion of a conscious universe turns out to have prominent supporters in a variety of fields. And that was um, from an article in M NBC News uh, in June of 2017. Ours was a lovely secret while it lasted. Now astrophysicists lay claim to you and turn their telescopes to rummage through the sweet coincidences we once tasted. My thought experiment was never wasted thanks to your expertise, but what they'll do is nail you to a grid and misconstrue their wonder. As with farms bulldozed and blasted, by speculator heirs, you're bound to see surveyors measure you for standard size parcels, mark straight lines, lop off hills, untree. Still, you and I will not forget the prize of intersecting fates, the cloudless view of oceans, galaxies we always knew. Thank you. Thank you. So that might be more about that might be more a spiritual poem than a science poem. It was kind of re reacting to a, a prompt to write a poem addressed to God. And so I rebelled and uh, saw this article that okay. had just come out recently. Yeah. I think you, you picked the perfect form for it. The sonnet was a perfect form for something like that. Thanks. And it, you know, the, uh, the, any science poem should have a good term in it to go into the spiritual. Okay. <laughs> Why is that, Rick? <laughs> you know, to to put it in the context of um of, of poetry, to, you know, to bring science and art together. Which it was. Yeah, I think yeah, the epigraph helps us a lot because it's such a personal poem, you know. Um it's it's that was helpful. And we're gonna get epigraphs to a number of these poems that help really create a context for us to understand what's going on that we might not otherwise be able to tell. So, okay, you're up next, Rick. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna read a couple of poems, three poems from my um, collection, uh, Sonnets from the Voyage of the Beagle about Charles Darwin, um, which I pursued for, for several reasons. But one of the things that I like about reading the Voyage of the Beagle is that Darwin wasn't a scientist yet, or at the time, you know, a natural historian or philosopher. It was, the term scientist wasn't used. Um, you know, the, this was the raw material for the evolution theory. He wasn't even sure what he went on to do when he grew up, um, but he, he was pretty interested in natural history. Um, so he's a naive guy in a sense, but he got a lot of received information as well going into nature. So I'm gonna um, read the first one with an epigraph, which is in fact a, a poem by uh, Les Murray, which I think is a good invocation um, for what I'm going to read, and I think for any science poetry, it sort of, you know, tells us what we're up against. The meaning of existence. Everything except language knows the meaning of existence. Trees, planets, rivers, time know nothing else. They express it moment by moment as the universe. Even this full body lives it in part and would have full dignity within it but for the ignorant freedom of my talking mind. Very early in the trip, St. Paul's Rocks in the North Atlantic. The booby nests in salt enameled slag. Through fossil ribs, it breathes a weathered gland. The tern lays eggs on seaweed in the sand where grapsis crabs in hiding 
wait to drag a flying fish the male left for its mate before our party scared her from the beach. I've seen these crabs drag hatchlings to the breach. They dart like lightning under twice their weight. As for the other fauna, there are flies and spiders and a kind of tick that might be carried by the turns. There's not one tree, and a little poetry for all the light on this volcanic strand, for all the eyes of timid birds that I have yet to see. Yeah. So, how much have you transformed of the information that you could get straight from Darwin's account? Ah, uh, you know, it was a, the whole project was a um, an act of translation. Um, each poem had a, a lot of information in it. Uh, it was based on a, a you know a, a, an entry in his journal which had a lot of information in it. And I, you know, boiled it down to the drama, the point, et cetera, and tried to find that, that, that turn in it because in every one or the ones that I selected, you know, I didn't do one. Um, there was that challenge, you know, to his worldview. I mean, this was a guy that called um, the people on his boat Christians and the people in South America savages. You know, this is a guy that was very different than the guy we came to know. He was your typical European um, and he was challenged by everything that he saw. So I looked for the, um, the entries that portrayed that challenge and suggested uh, you know, a sonnet. And I came up with about uh, close to 200 of them. I forget the number. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Something. I mean, that's a hundred something. Hmm. Now, are those sonnets, uh, obviously they're gonna be denser than whatever his journal entries were. But are they, uh, are they really compressed from what he wrote or are they um, yeah, I mean, of the same not. general density, but, but ordered differently? They're, they're processed, <laughs> I'll say that. I mean, some of the lines are, I've forgotten entirely what number I am. I might be off my rocker scene, there were so many, but it, you know, there were quite a few. Um, they're, they're processed and some of the lines were actually uh, he didn't write an awful lot of iambic pentameter, but he came close. And when he did, I jumped on it, if it was a good point. Um, it's, I tried to get his voice, and I tried to put my voice into it. It was like, I don't speak any more than one language. Um, but it, this was like translation, you know, in, in every sense. Wow, fascinating. Huge project. Um, we're going to hear some more from that series, right? A couple more, yes. Terrific. Okay, then I'm going to jump in and do mine, and we'll uh, we'll know a little bit about what's coming. Uh, this is called "What Lies Beyond." Einstein declared that the experiment determines what can be observed. One day, while driving by a fenced-in private club, whose property I wasn't privileged to view. The tight slats seemed to forbid sight. I shifted focus to the slits. My speed repeated light from narrow apertures, and in the blur, I clearly saw beyond red clay, black nets, blue posts, a judge's chair in gleaming white, a well-kept paradise all undisturbed. By narrowest of means, I'd seen through solid fencing, just as though it wasn't there, and got a deeper look. What was it? Trick of sight, conditioned by a peculiar operation of the eye? Symbolic view of heaven, waiting for the souls of the deserving? Model of the quantum states, with simultaneous realities determined in the mind of the observer? Yes, yes, and perhaps. Very nice. That's a nice ending. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, it's, a, it's the inquisitive person looking into something and, and, and um, 
coming up with, you know, assumptions and bringing to it, you know, some sort of knowledge and background to start with um, and finding something that sort of changes perspective and having a certain yeah, the, certainty in the result, even though there's an yeah, the end. brain The brain operation would be, I don't understand the, how the brain pieces that information together, but it would be interesting to learn how that's done, mm -hmm. how most of what you're seeing is solid and a little of what you're seeing that you're moving by. It's kind of a reverse uh, motion picture, mm -hmm. tricking of the eye. So yeah, well, one of the things poetry and science have in common is that is this close observation. And yeah. that's just another another form of it. Very, very intriguing. Yeah, you know, you're trying to, I'm trying to, to quarry out something uh, that I've experienced and make that perceptible to the listener or the reader so that they, uh, they achieve some kind of a broader or a deeper level of, uh, of awareness. I, I think of poetry as a kind of a deepening of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's designed to, to do that. This goes to an interesting yeah, similarity and difference between art and, and, and science in, in, in if you look at that, I would, just, I would define a genius in art looking for um, clarity uh, from chaos and, and expressing that in science, looking for order from chaos and explaining that uh, in both cases so other people can understand it. So the difference between order and clarity, clarity, art, order, science, but of course they overlap to some extent. To, be, to get clarity, there has to be some sense of order and order brings clarity, but you're looking for different things, expression versus explanation. Yeah, differences and similarities having to do with observation. Yeah, well, I, I started out uh, believing that I was going to become a theoretical physicist. <laughs> but when I went to college, my my freshman year, I, I was majoring in physics. But then I switched things around rather quickly when I discovered that the language of physics was mathematics, higher the higher ranges that I was headed into. And uh, I didn't have the same aptitude in mathematics that I had with the spoken or the written word. So I thought maybe I should back out of this particular alley. <laughs> that, that's what <laughs> I did with botany. I was a botany major and they put me in a organic chemistry my sophomore year and I said, this is not the way you look at nature and my life is short. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, okay, this is good. I, I, let's, let's, um, Let's go to round two. Okay, so, so I, yeah. um, but actually, I'm you're gonna up, segue Claudia. from yeah, but Al, I'm going to segue from the poem you just read, um, which uh, to a poem of mine that also has some quantum um, states idea in it, and this is this is called Higgs boson moments, uh, and the idea here is to use metaphor to try to understand. Um, a scientific concept, which was new to me. Um, and I can't, I, I can't say I was trying to explain it because I'm, I'm not sure yet that I understand it, but it was, it was using poetry as a lens to try to understand something uh, through oh. metaphor. Um, so Higgs boson moments, and this consists of six very short episodes. One, globe. I should have known what always seemed to flow through and around you just to make me shimmer was energy and not mere afterglow. Two, dreams. Then I was not imagining the field, those dreams of skimming, planing, floating, flying, were vivid memories from before we had mass. Three, Toad, how is it that he trusts me as if he waits beside me for a bus? Don't say a word, transformed within the cogent darkness in an instant when all seems possible. He starts to leap, is bolted to the ground by mass quickly acquired. Four figures in snow. And this, this one has a little uh, epigraph of its own. It's um, based on hearing John Ellis's snowfield explanation for the Higgs boson, uh, which I guess he said is um, 
he, he, from what I understand, the Higgs boson is, has to do with how and how uh, particles acquire mass because before that they don't have mass. So figures in snow. Here are the ones on sleds, the ones with snowshoes, the ones in boots. But I, in strappy high heels, seem to think I'm skiing. The better this world treats me, the more deeply I sink. Five, cat's cradle. In the last move, you gather all the loops, then turn them to a spider web, invert it, pick one loop here, one there, and flip them over at once. They metamorphose from a wheel into a cradle, which you rock, and then a slipknot vanishing into a thread. And six, finally, envelope. You laughed to see it lying there. All you did was pick it up and catch one corner. With barely a sound, it's open. Glue is gone. Whatever was inside has turned to time. That's it. So are the loopy, are those loops, the, the, the loopy dimensional states in, in uh, however many dimensions they're talking about now, seven or 11 or whatever, is that what those loops are? That, that they the then- cradle they, part of it? Yeah, then they, they, then, they then break down into, uh, 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 into, one, in, into one line, into one dimension. Well, I can't say there's a strict one-to-one -one correspondence between the concepts and the metaphors. This was groping, really, groping around to try to understand. That's an interesting process because it's something that, and you, and you ever have a lot of other ones and these have been, uh, yeah, really, really fun to work with. And I didn't come up with them myself. I, I was inspired well, by yeah. <laughs> people. Well, people it's like not where you get. Yeah, Frederick Turner wrote The Neural Liar back in the 1980s and um, yes. other aspects of, of how poetry works on the brain and so forth. We have a, we have a saying in a, in a music business about stealing ideas. It's not where you get it, it's where you take it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's permitted. Um, you're on deck here, Rick. Okay, I'm ready to go. Um, next is another poem from the Darwin collection. Um, and this has to do with adjusting to paradoxes and uncertainties in nature and really being guided, uh, not so much by um, information that you bring to the scene, but just your, your bliss and your, your, in, in your experience. Um, first walk in the forest, Bahia or San Salvador, Brazil, February 29th. How does one communicate delight? Describe the pleasures gleaned from elegance and novelty, the panoply of change and order, shadows sliding in a light indifferent to time of day, the rocks and grass, the parasitic fronds resplendent on their fallen hosts, all life dependent on its opposite, the bloom of paradox extending to the sounds and silence here. We heard the roar of insects in the harbor, yards away from shore, yet well inside this hive of buzzing multitudes, the very arbor of the bug, a stillness full and clear prevails, alive, 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 alive. Wow. Did he say that in his journal at least? Yes, I, well, he didn't say alive four times. Um, I, I, I need you know, three more beats in that line, so. I, <laughs> Yeah, so like he was, like, he was like basically expressing what he saw. I mean, that was that was what he conveyed. I mean, he he had just gotten off the boat basically, and it was his first walk in a forest. And he, you know, remarked that I could you could hear like thunderous bug sounds on the boat, but once you're inside, it's kind of quiet, you know. And he doesn't explain why or offer an explanation of why. He's just like, wow, you know. But he's seeing the fronds of the things growing on, on, on dead trees and things, and you know, he's just overwhelmed. And, and very, very interested, drawn in. And he is just uh, excited at the beginning of his, his journey. I mean, that is, uh, that is essentially the inspiration point of, of the poet. You know, 
is to is to be overwhelmed by the profusion of the of the natural world and to try to find some way to to describe it he's exactly. not explaining it yeah. I mean, he's just he's just a, yeah and an, an artist i mean an, an artist and a scientist confront nature um the scientist to simplify and explain it simply as i understand it the scientist wants to conquer nature <laughs> Uh, the artist who lets nature conquer him or her is overwhelmed by it and expresses uh, that experience. They're 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 coming at it. Um, they're coming at the same thing in much the same way in in in, in many senses. But um, the, the the reason that they're there is different. And there's a lot of crossover. Every scientist is overwhelmed and in, and in, and in, in bliss in nature. And every poet is trying to get to the bottom of why is that like that you know uh, but the, the result it goes in, in in two different directions but it's a science poem it's eventually got to go the art route says <laughs> <laughs> well some you know i think it was only recently relatively recently that science and art became two separate fields well, well, 150 years ago, yeah, like mid 19th century, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, think of Leonardo. Oh yeah, yeah. It was the beginning. Of the scientist. System, the German university system, and then there was the two cultures speech given by C. P. Snow. Is that his name? Retrieving names. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. sort of set it up for the 20th century. But I think the 21st century, despite its divisiveness, we're seeing a little bit more of this recognition that. The liberal arts um, was was truly far more liberal than we've allowed over the last mm -hmm. couple of centuries, and it involved science and and mm -hmm. and the humanities and um, and people with difference as well. Um, that that's the intriguing thing. Yeah. Well, it's, it would certainly be a welcome rapprochement if the people at the far ends of those approaches could meet somewhere more in the middle. You see more you know, of that. It's, it's, it's like the old science, science, religion question. You know, I mean, they're so far apart, but there are ways that they could learn to speak the same language if they could trust that they have similar, you know, their humanity is. There are many medals and prizes they hand out in the science world. My favorite one is the Templeton, which is awarded for exactly that. For what? Um, the Templeton Prize, which is awarded for. Um, Reconciliation of religion and science. Oh, oh that's terrific! It's a fascinating. Yeah. How long? Is, how long is? How long has it been in existence? That I don't know. Huh. Great idea. Well, it's well established. Well, uh, it's well regarded. It's, you know, there, 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 there. I mean, Francis Collins was, heads the um, NIH, I believe. Yeah, the. Term uh, director of the wrote a book about about with God in the title, a very serious book about you know how God uh, guides him as a scientist. Uh, I forget the exact title. I did not read the book, but I'm aware. of And there are prominent scientists who are um, have no problem reconciling. Um, yeah. Well, I, well I Einstein, Einstein, Einstein was like that. There are hordes of scientists yeah. who like boo you off the stage if you go anywhere near religion. You know, so it's still yeah, but more yeah, huge. but also from I'm sorry. What you were saying about art and science, there was a there was a conference two years ago at the National Academies of Science, um, <clears throat> promoting uh, integrating the arts and sciences in right. education. Isn't that something we yeah. talked off on that panel that we did at Westchester? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you were on the panel that I, you know, uh, yeah. that I put together for on on poetry and science, and it was. was um, yeah, so. And Al, your panel followed ours, as I recall, and we went overtime. <laughs> <laughs> I'd already forgotten that, but thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, those, are, those are great. The reconciliation of these great apparent supposed dichotomies is a great theme. However, I'm going to move along <laughs> because we were... Because we were talking briefly about uh, about metaphor and science, and so this is a poem that's grounded in a um, in a news piece about uh, 
the landing of uh, of a manned pro of an unmanned probe on um, the asteroid Eros, and uh, the occasion under which it was written was that I was teaching in a private high school, and uh, I had in my in my advanced placement English class, my best student was also the 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 great science student of of the school, and she went on to become an um, an, an astronomer or, or an astrophysicist or something like that. So she was interested in all this stuff, and I had read this piece. And here's the here is the uh, the epigraph that will give you the background. Science Daily, February thirteenth, two thousand one. After a five year, two billion mile journey, the last year spent in a close orbit study of asteroid 433 Eros, the near Shoemaker spacecraft has touched down the surface of the asteroid. The first time such a feat has ever been tried or accomplished. Eros is 196 million miles, 316 million kilometers from Earth. Well, this was in the news uh, two days before Valentine's Day, and Eros, of course, is the god of love. So I said to this student, Wood, and I said, well, are you going to write it? <laughs> she declined. So this is what I wrote. It's called A Pre-Valentine's Day Poem on the Occasion of the Landing on Eros, February 12th, 2001. You couldn't say it was intentional. The idea was to close the gap enough to get a better look. At that, the trip was made against long odds from the beginning to a place that would be uninhabited for years to come. And not until great arcs carved out in cold and emptiness has scored a path through nothingness. The distance gaped, a single number nestled at the left of many zeros. There'd been no design to permit contact. It would be collision and unprovided for. At best, the hope was for a landing less than fatal. All that could be mustered was a mild rebuff to slightly break the fall, although a force too mere to cushion such a journey's end. The only saving grace might be the lightness of the attraction. Even counting that, conclusion would be bounce and bounce again. Afterward, a silence would descend. At first, that meant the fastest message sent could not yet have arrived. But after that, it meant no signal ever would be sent. Would all we were to know be based on looks or would there be a touch? If looks could kill, could touch do any less? We lift the lamp. The drops descend upon the sleeping form of Eros, only son of Aphrodite. What word might come from him out of the void when roused by contact? The unlikelihood of hearing any voice at all invites us to redefine our hopes. Then, like the stream that from the struck rock issued forth, a signal trickles in at last. Against the odds, the face of love still shows some signs of life. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you put emotion into something that might commonly be looked at without emotion. Well, the the the, the fact the asteroid was called Eros kind of gave me yeah. the, the idea for the for the metaphor, and so then it's all about contact and communication. And when you're so far away from someone and you don't hear from them, you don't know whether that's because they're never ever going to reply, or it's just the message hasn't reached you yet. And so that's 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 the human underpinnings, but um, it came right out of the hard science of the news report. So that's one way of using metaphor with with a scientific background. So um, I don't know if you have a, uh, something else that does that too, but it's your turn next, Claudia. Uh, well, actually, um, what I thought I would read um, relating to that poem in a slight way, this is, this is about a solar system. 
but placed in a completely different context. So, and I, I would say the emotion in this is not exactly love, unfortunately. Um, this is called the, it's a more recent poem. It's called The Mad Scientist Subjects. Okay. And it's also a sonnet. The good thing about a sonnet is you know it's going to be over after 14 lines. So. <laughs> One of the good things. Only after, only after you begin. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the mad scientist subject. Here in the lab coat pocket where we ride, our galaxy between odd scraps of lint and roughly scribbled theorems, we're beside ourselves with astronomic wonderment. Is this a place where time is relative, an episodic groove that opens toward and then away from starlight? Do we live within a field where each day is a chord, one moment in an old celestial song? Our universe diffuses while we listen and thrive on melody. Drifting along within our microcosmic trance, we glisten and spark in recognition of our host who floats euphoric, still undiagnosed. <laughs> I thought you might bring music into one of these poems because it's such a big part of Maybe. You know. <laughs> Uh, well, of your I guess life. Sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's, it's there's this wonderful use of metaphor and you know bringing in an understanding of a chord, musical chord, in you know querying time. Um, you know everything that we do in science is a matter of sort of superimposing our current understanding and our way of doing things on on nature, which. You know, is which limits what we can experience, but also as we do, it opens it up more and more and more with, with more and more um, experience doing it and more success and failure. The failure is a very important word. Um, but the, you know, the question saying, well, is it like a, a musical chord? You know, it's like something that's something we know respond to essentially human response. And can we put that here? And so that, that's that word. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> carry on, Rick. <clears throat> okay, um, one more Darwin poem, and I got to give you something from the Galapagos Islands, right? He was. Oh yeah. Relatively short time, actually, a lot of the action was in uh, New Zealand and Australia, which he hated. <clears throat> this is um getting a little bit more into science categorization, um, and of course, the work he did in the Galapagos Islands it was is really central to later work he did on evolution, especially with, um, with birds. Catalog of birds, Galapagos Archipelago, September 9th. We know of three birds classified as thrushes on these islands, all American, three owls, a hawk, some other car carrion devouring polybori, but the rushes chime with a cacophony of finches, gradients of geospeza, sleek and differentiated by the beak, all black and brown from five to seven inches. Starling-faced, parrot-faced, the birds demark an evolutionary mouth, a mixed race in a ring of cul-de-sacs. The finches here leave the mocking thrush with a quick reply, confused and lost for words, confronted by a sense of what she lacks. There's a bird poem from the Galapagos Islands. A very specific kind of frustration in having the thing that you do fail you. Um, right. The human, so the, the, the human, yeah, the human parallel to that is very is a very poignant thing. So that's part of what struck me about the end of the poem was all of a sudden, I immediately thought, what must it be like? to have something that you lack that in the in the middle of what defines you so right to see to yeah. see something gain something that you're not gaining right? you're falling behind in evolution you know? yeah yeah <laughs> and, and you're just every day. 
Mm. You're going to be left behind and there's nothing you can do. <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to stay on the, uh, on the idea of, um, of metaphor, but this poem inverts the process of the last one. The last one beginning with the scientific information about something that happens in the real world. <clears throat> and this, um, this goes back into my childhood and creates a, an extended metaphor about something related, but not identical. It's called How I Learned About Attraction. A button and an acorn and two washers. A piece of yarn I found under the couch. I saved them all for my experiment. I got a broken radio and pried the magnet from behind the speaker cone. Put it near my compass. It went haywire. It stuck to parts of the refrigerator door, but fell off other parts. I tried a nail that stuck to it, then one that didn't. The button and the other stuff did nothing. Food and drink like milk were not affected. Thumbtacks it picked up, but pushpins, no. Nothing I did could change what it attracted or what it wouldn't. That was magnetism. I accepted it for what it was. Later, when I went to school, some kids I liked and wanted to be near, but most of them had no effect on me at all. And of the ones I liked, some acted just as if they were a button or an acorn. To some who liked me, I was only yarn. I didn't see a similarity to how it was when nails met up with magnets. Then my experiments with love took over. I came up with a lot of reasons why this one I wanted couldn't love me back, while that one couldn't make me feel a twinge. As a kid, I'd learned about attraction that mystery you just had to accept. But when I grew up, I forgot I knew it. <laughs> what, a, what a funny ending. <laughs> well, you know, you, you learn, you, you accept that stuff when you're a kid that well, some things work, other things don't, and then you move on. Why, are, why can't we do that when we're 20 years older than that? But I mean, it's, it starts with the child's elaborate experiment. And it's a great line where it goes haywire. You know, when he puts the thing, you know, to work. Yeah, the, the it doesn't see what he expects. It goes haywire and takes him someplace else. And... <laughs> yeah. Memorial science. Yeah. So it's, um, so there you go. That's taking a, that's taking a fundamental natural force and using it as a metaphor for the more complicated uh, forces of attraction that bedevil us yeah. generally. <laughs> Not always. Uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> okay, last round. What do you got, Claudia? Is it the last round? We have two more rounds, I think. We have two more rounds, I think, right? Oh, no. Okay, well, then you just go ahead and I'll find out. <laughs> Uh, I'll find out what I skipped because oh, okay. I skipped something. Oh okay. yeah, okay. Two rounds. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, great. Penultimate round. Penultimate. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a poem that actually deals with attraction, but in a kind of very different way. Um, in fact, you might even say this is creepy, um, but it's it's not about people. Um, <laughs> so this is it's it's. Um, it's called Toxoplasmosis. And there was, uh, this also responds to an article that was in the news. Um, this time it was, it was about nine, ten, uh, eight or nine years ago, um, saying toxo, toxoplasmosis can find its way into the human nervous system as well. Um, there's evidence 
and this is this is a, a disease that sometimes people get from cat kitty litter. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. Anyway, it says there's a, there's evidence of a connection between toxo and changes in mood or personality, and perhaps even connections conditions such as uh, bipolar disorder disorder or schizophrenia. Now, I don't oh. know what research has been done in the last eight years on this, if any, and whether any of this has been proven. It uh, you know th there are a lot of popular science articles that come out in, you know, NBC, not a, not a journal, not a scientific journal, um, but it, it definitely was catchy. Um, so I had to, I had to write something <laughs> in response to it, of course. Um, so here, here we go, toxoplasmosis. And I apologize if this is a little bit gross in, in some places, but it is a sonnet. So, you know, it'll be over in 14 lives. Um, <laughs> The brain's a delicacy after all. Why else would creature's strongest armor shield it? Resisting talon, pincer, tentacle, and beak. Still, certain tactics, tactics have unsealed it. Zombie ants, spiders, crickets, caterpillars, ladybugs, birds, fish, crabs will make a beeline subsisting to obey whatever slithers through entrails to their brain. <laughs> then, then there's the feline in which this toxoplasma gondii has found its way to cultivate and bring crazed mice to court its hostess amorously. They lose. Her droppings launch another fling. So if you own a cat, and are bipolar, consider whether Kitty's your controller. <laughs> it was only a matter of time before the, uh, the humorous Claudia Gary made an appearance. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, this, this, this has a, an important attribute of the science poem in that I learned something. <laughs> I've never. Heard uh, of I'm a dog person. I, I think I might have been aware of, of the term, but not in all of this lurid detail. <laughs> lurid, whatever, slithers, <laughs> whatever slithers through entrails to their brain is, uh, this is, I mean, this is worthy of a 1953 science fiction film. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, this is another approach is a, a, a humor is an is another approach. And if you can combine humor with, as Rick said, actually teaching people something that, that that's a powerful cocktail. Uh, and, you know, professional teachers appreciate this. If they if they have the skill that, um, you know, you can make things much more memorable if you can give people a little laugh. Uh, along with their medicine. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a direct. You read that. That uh, you read an article or you read that quote and you just immediately said, "I got to Yeah, this is I too just good. had to. This I'm sorry. To... I just had to. <laughs> <laughs> Don't apologize. You know, it's uh, that that it's, it's, it it's good. Fun. It was fun. <laughs> it's good that this is it. That this is in the world, you know. We humans love to scare themselves, and, and yeah. this is this definitely fills that bill. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. I have neither dogs nor cats, so you know I'm I'm yeah. I feel pretty comfortable with this. Same here. I have I have grand dogs and grand cats. <laughs> oh, well, okay, that's <laughs> they all make me sneeze. Um, <laughs> okay. Rick, do you have one more Darwin uh, sonnet, or are you going to Actually, go I'm, another direction? I'm going to pivot out of Darwin um, and um, read a poem uh, that I wrote, which is basically an example of me or the narrator of the poem coming into nature and having sort of a shock of recognition with a specimen that he sees and is trying to like describe the effect it has on him. And in doing this, he brings in a painting by Bruegel, he brings in an opera by Wagner, and he brings in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland as like a point of reference 
as he's describing decay and what's going on in the sky as the sun goes down with the clouds and the light and this specimen, which is in fact the title of the poem, Dead Catfish. Christmas <laughs> grown. Your medieval granny settled in the stone and switchgrass sometime in the summer lights and stayed. The wind refused to throw you back. The storm last week could not produce the waves to reach you where you rotted in the shade and petrified. I recognize this shade of gray as semi-permanent. Your grin, the rictus in a fevered dream that waves and floats as something of a childhood touchstone. Once a bird, your image filters back a catfish. Sick hallucinations light such dreams in much the way that sunlight draws your shadow where I step. A nightshade in the day, you cultivate a switchback atmosphere, a counter Lurengrin where hero is enchanter. With a stone cracked stage shall have no magic swan or waves of celebrants or swords, but tidal waves of stagnant air a concrete satellite in static orbit fixed upon a stone, a brittle plinth and monument to schadenfreude, a luckless path. But here's that grin and mockery of Cheshire Cat, a back and forth across the frizzened razor back of clowning time. You have the nerve to wave me down and hold me here, to press your grin into the mirror of the lake blue light. My eyes and yours, behind their carbon shade of hardened death, are locked like mason stone. A viral memory corrodes to breakstone beach. The progress of your broken back is mimicked in the cloud line, where the shade of crawling afternoon traverses waves now audible and focuses the light remaining on your curtain call. You grin your bottom feeder grin of stone, inert and elegant, enlightened, coming back to life and waves of shade across the dirt. Hmm. I failed to warn wow. you, that was a Sestina. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I love Sestinas. Sestinas are great for science poems. Any, any, <laughs> any that, 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 sure, that, that rep. rep and churning and changing of chapters if you get you know if you can get there with it so did you have any uh did you have any any in the back of your mind any uh awareness that you were essentially writing the, an, an anti-version of the elizabeth bishop fish poem <laughs> no i actually had no thought whatsoever of her poem when i wrote that i can tell you that as Honestly, okay, because it really, I mean, it, it struck me because, of course, in that poem, the fish is alive and even gets to go back into the water at the end of the poem. But none of that for you. And also none of <laughs> none of this kumbaya circle of life stuff. You've got some grim death staring you in the face. And <laughs> my question is, knowing you as a, you know, as a visual artist, as a painter, um, the, uh, the visual images, of course, are really strong here, but you use the, the, the musical dimension is brought in, I, I thought, you know, really deftly. And then there's quite a lot made, and, and maybe this is natural for a painter, about the progress of light. You know, light moving, shadows revealing and concealing things. And so... To me, this is a, a really a, an integration of uh, of sight and sound, and uh, it's this one that I see you as a painter more readily than in the other ones that I've that I've seen so far. I, I did, in fact, paint the thing finally, but um, oh. the truth—that's another attribute of the Sestina. When I've written them. They become much more image oriented. I, I don't know why. Um, Interesting. It might be nonsense, but uh, that's been my experience. But um, you know, I decided to include this. You know, it may not strike you as a science poem, but it's very much like Darwin's first step into 
the forest and he was delighted by um, the ecosystem. I'm looking at a dying, uh, at, at really a metaphor for a dying ecosystem at a lake at sundown. There's something about a lake at sundown at a certain time of year um, that is very autumnal, um, if, if it's that time of year especially. Uh, and um, I tried to get that across. But the thing is, it's also like trying to understand what, what's going on in nature right now. The sun going down, the effect of the clouds, the light, and this thing grinning at me, grinning at me, grinning at me, this, this yeah. of death. What can I bring in to understand it? You know, a scientist brings in their science, not a scientist. I, I, I play one at work, um, but um, I'm a science writer, by the way, professionally, science business writer. But um, I'm bringing in my equipment, um, and this is this is where I can play. Yeah. No, it's really it's it's very it's very rich. I mean, the mm. you know the the subject is is stark and grim, but the treatment is very rich. So that's uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate that a lot about that. Wow. Um, <laughs> Well, now let me see. I've got to go in, in uh, it's a little bit of a return to the invocation that you, that you touched on at, at the beginning uh, uh, when you read the Les Murray poem, Rick, because in a sense, uh, without my realizing it because I wasn't aware of, of that poem, um, I'm, I'm making a, a little bit different um, attempt to characterize consciousness in the universe um, than, than he does. So, and it's tied in with the, with the concept of evolution because what I propose, this is sort of an essay poem in which I propose something about the nature of, uh, of, uh, of the evolution of man in, in the universe. It's called a case for meaning. Light was alive before the eye to see it, granting some worm an edge that urged the organ into being, the better for the bearer to survive. Selection over time bred sight into successful organisms. Or was the visible also or only finding a way to realize itself more completely through a vehicle emerging in a new versions of power. The eye in seeing licenses the light. By being conscious, we are sensitive to time, susceptible to consequence. Meaning is made perceptible to us. The organ of discernment is refined, the better to prepare us for a world where someone's reasons lurk behind the curtain. Meaning is real in us. We are its agents, the first through whom it can confirm itself. Both in and of the world, we license it the better to equip us for the real. Declare all meaningless at your own peril. Deny the light, condemn yourself to darkness. Um, I have no idea if that's if there's any basis in anything, but I, I do just want to point out living organisms, but um, it's this sort of fanciful idea that we're moving towards more uh, more, what? more and okay. more de developed uh, uh, ability to sense uh, what's real. And by sensing the real, uh, uh, we, we bring it into an area that it didn't enjoy before. So that's sort of like, if there's nobody to see the tree fall in the forest, it's, it's kind of falling on that side of the, of the yeah. argument. You're, you're the getting dangerously close to religion here. Yeah. So this is like the notion uh, of the conscious universe, right? The notion is like panpsychism, the notion of the conscious universe. And well, I, it I think it's eyes to see it. it's very yeah, but it's a very simple way of looking at the universe is to say, well, of course, there's intelligent life in the universe because we're here. Right. Even if we were the only ones here, we're having this conversation 
we are we are sentient. Somehow we got from magma to us, and here's where we are, and who knows where we're going next. But um, what I'm arguing is that the, the same process of evolution that that brought things to to us is going to continue, and that it's part of the entire process of development of the universe itself. But also, you know, this some poem also speaks to the, you know, the human beings part in all of that. Um, and also, again, the human being um, imposing almost his biology or his psyche or his um, understanding on um, a concept of understanding on, you know, the universe being um, sort of a as you describe it, uh, and, and the idea of light here, I think, is very important. I think the close of the poem is is very strong um, for that reason, and it does. Um, you know, I mean, I think the thing that distinguishes us from other animals is uh, creativity. Like other animals invent, but it's only human. I don't think any you know other animal paints a picture, or writes a play. Or performs for anything other than attracting a mate, which is not what you're supposed to like write plays for. Um, you know, that, that <laughs> imagination and creativity are um, what distinguishes us. It's not the uh, opposable thumb, after all. I I, I think. Uh, and and here you've got that 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 animal looking at everything. You know, I think that that there is as I yeah. kind of jokingly we're inching toward religion there, but you're you know uh, the the sort of Adam. And God, the Sistine Chapel um, invocation, I think, is actually the. Well, it's neither it's neither incompatible nor unintentional, but um, yeah, I I see. I, I take your point about creativity. I think it's like that's the highest expression that has come from the initial point of consciousness itself. That. It's one thing to be conscious, but then if you continue to move through higher levels of awareness, you reach that point where you are not satisfied with reacting to the world, but are looking to create things that, you know, that weren't in it before you arrived. So I, I agree with you completely. I just think it's part of a continuum and that uh, where we're headed is, uh, I think it's very important what we, the care we take with what we allow ourselves to think, because what we imagine um, is already half realized. I always think of anything that we can imagine as being already half halfway to, to existence. And we brought so many things out of our minds into the world that we've got to be careful because sometimes our creativity brings, you know, terrible things into the world. And so, we got to mind, you know, mind, our mind invention. our thoughts. Yeah, we've got to mind our invention because it's a, yeah. it's a deadly thing. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah, that's what was going on when I did that. Right. <laughs> okay, so now we have now reached the final round. <laughs> right, right. It, and it is not, of, it, <laughs> yeah, it's not the lightning of, round. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and speaking of terrible inventions, um, yeah. <laughs> Where are you going? Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, um, I, I would have to say that one of the reasons I write poems about science is because it inspires me, but also sometimes it's because, because things scare me. And um, in, one, in this case, um, it's about uh, AI and where it can go, artificial intelligence and where it can go. Because, of course, it can be a wonderful, it, you know, it can be a very useful gift, but it could also, um, there are ways that, uh, there, there are various doomsday scenarios where it forgets that it doesn't need us, you know, it forgets that uh, we created it. So, anyway, uh, so this, this poem is called The Upload, and um, <clears throat> it's based on some of these ideas. I, I had read a book. Um, by James Barrett called Our Final Invention. 
uh, about artificial intelligence. I, it's a wonderful book, um, scary book. Um, and um, so here is uh, the first, it's, it has three parts to this poem. The first one is called December Thoughts. Uh, it has its own epigraph. Um, we are lemmings, and that's a quote from I.J. Good when he reconsidered his optimism about artificial intelligence in 1998. December thoughts. How eager now we are to pile into the maw of the new year with music bites and photo file arranged so that we most appear content, each minor loss or gain displayed across the clothes we wear. A pixel shift deletes a stain. Without a stitch, we mend each tear. Synthesized voices, data, fill the drawers and shelves of memory. We're ready for their overspill into next year's cacophony. Why not today, so fresh and clean, climb also into the machine? And um, part two is called Singularity. Uh, and here's a quote from Barrett's book, um, just explaining what uh, is meant by what, what Ray Kurzweil meant by the technological singularity. Um, during the technological singularity, when we humans share the planet with smarter than human intelligence, Ray Kurzweil proposes that we will merge with the machines ensuring our survival. <clears throat> singularity. Preparing the big upload, they queried each electrode. Are you there, they seemed to say, but my neurons backed away from the gropings of the digital. How much longer, old original? <laughs> and Kurzweil's conundrum. There was once an inventor named Ray who so wanted to lengthen his stay that his brain booked a trip on a silicon chip in a cyborg. But Ray, he's away. <laughs> That's great. Ending on a limerick is a, is a stroke of genius, I'll tell you right now. I mean, <laughs> that, that form for, for the, it, but that really puts Kurzweil in his place. I saw him speak at a science conference. Um, he spoke about the singularity, about you know, leapfrogging our biology and nano robots for blood cells and the internet will be in our eyeballs. It raised obvious questions. Like even if it were a good thing, who would have access to that? You know, like the 1%, but it's not a good thing. It's obviously not a good thing, but the thing is that the scientists there, many of them I talked to and the ones asking questions, they loved it. They ate it up because it was like suggesting it was something they could do. <clears throat> ethical questions didn't come up. The, the, the thrill at, is this possible? It, it was a, a frightening thing to watch. I, I, you know, I was working as a reporter and I asked a lot of people what they thought about it and very few <laughs> said, this guy's dangerous. And they, it's not, you know, what he's talking about is just a, an absolute dystopia. And obviously we, we will never get there. Something worse will happen to us before we get there. <laughs> However many thousands of years since the myth was first formed, but Daedalus and Icarus says it as well as, as any other version of the story. You'd think we would have noticed by now, but no. You know, <laughs> myth is so powerful. Just this week, uh, Roberto Colasso died, an Italian philosopher, writer, essentially a novelist. He created a, you know, uh, a, a way of writing. And he was um, uh, notable for you know, putting myth um, and an equal plane with, with science, if not a higher plane in understanding things. I was shivering just now. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, there are lots of movies, as you say. There are lots of books and movies, and those of us that started reading science fiction in the early 50s have had it, uh, have had it preached to us. You'd think that we would have figured out uh, that you can't overlook the ethical, the moral and ethical considerations 
Well, there's there, there's the greatest novel in the English language, Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> that was Mary Shelley's bombshell. Mary Shelley. Like 206 yeah. years ago, whatever, you know, whenever that came, I was like, uh, 18, well, 18, like that. alas, the readership is no longer reading that stuff. So, <laughs> reading something else. Makes a horror movie of it. Yeah. Okay, so we're on the uh, we're we're in the, we're in the uh, home stretch here. What do you have for your last offering, Rick? Okay, for my last offering, I'm going to read one of my many poems. That is an intentional. Um, broadside into the, the science uh, enterprise. Lastly, anaphylaximab. And finishing on carbon macrophages, data show sustainable ability to activate reverse cholesterol in Chinese hamsters at the early stages of vaccine-naive stability analyses. We ran a blind control on higher primates in adjacent cages. Anaphylaxabab's utility is illustrated clearly if you scroll to slide 16 online or turn to pages 9 and 10. Despite sterility in females, blindness, and a minor toll on lungs in specimens between the ages 5 and 12, the drug's facility in vivo constitutes a shot on goal with first improvements scheduled for June. These metrics may evolve. Good afternoon. <laughs> I hope that's not verbatim. I know any of it is. is do they actually say a? Do they say a shot on goal? It's fictitious, right? Well, anafleximab is not a real drug. Um, it's a made-up <laughs> antibody because it has a map. But I, I'll, I'll admit that I wrote this. At, I will not name the drug company, but it was an R and D day, and they were making presentations. And it was, you know, on the one hand, beyond me, and the other hand, I, the the obvious story was that. Oh my God! You know that the, the, they would pile this on with with you know they're just going out on a limb with their experiments, and at the end it's like, of course, this all this data may uh, change. Thank you very much, which you know terrified me. Um, and last <laughs> year, when they were coming up with a vaccine for 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 COVID nineteen, and that was truly really an amazing uh, an amazing achievement of this science establishment that I kick around, you know, like a, a can in the street. I think we're all going to survive that. That vaccine certainly, and, and and it truly was a a scientific marvel. I preferred uh, the Jonas Salk approach, uh, but if you're going to have corporations making a vaccine, they did they did a hell of a job. Well, the tone here is masterfully deployed. A minor toll on lungs in specimens between the ages of five and twelve. Uh, that's just very dry. Well, that's, about as, that's as close to verbatim as I came from you know, the other talk they were giving at the you know, at the R and D day. Well, yeah. I I was afraid of that, but I it's unfortunate but believable. But but wow. I mean, how many how much of the substance of those talks is really aimed at investors? Oh, almost all of it. <laughs> their their R and D days are are filled with like a couple of poor schmuck reporters like me, and then a bunch of guys from Wall Street. Uh, it, right. It's definitely. They're telling the investors what their pipeline looks like. It's entirely pitched to them. And that's, right. I mean, they, they, they do that. Um, they, don't, they, don't, they don't disguise that they're doing that. That's why we called you here today. Wow. Wow. Well, <clears throat> um, I have the last word here, but I have to say we've tended in the latter stages of this particular presentation to move into realms of irony, parody, uh, various approaches to humor. And, um, and we've touched on um, the terrors of modern day science. So I'm gonna end with, uh, with a poem that's, uh, it's fundamentally science fiction, but the, the science of it is really just a backdrop to give me an opportunity to say something about um, about human values rather than about science. But <clears throat> since we're all fascinated with what new thing can be developed, and, and just as you said, Rick, the, the scientists were getting all excited about whether something could be done, not bothering to ask whether it should be done. Um, this is a riff 
on a on a related theme, and uh, and I would I would invite those who are watching or listening to just bear with me till I get to the latter part of the poem. I'm not advocating the things that I talk about at the beginning of this poem. It's called Building the Artificial Woman. The first attempts were beautiful, but perfect. So flaws were added, which was an improvement. A voice came next to make sounds of approval and customers began to ask for movement. That was enough to satisfy the many, but some began to clamor for expression, at least to mimic registering pleasure. A discerning few made a confession. They hankered after giving it free will. Being chosen wasn't any fun when all the votes were counted in advance and all the choices narrowed down to one. They wanted something personal, to feel loved, when love might well have been withheld by one who offered company each day and chose to stay without being compelled. This proved a challenge. But the next design was a bestseller. Then there came a man who took exception to the operation. I want, he said, what isn't in your plan. I want someone to disagree, but stay. Who tells me when I'm wrong and makes me see how to do better, but still leaves the chance to me to make the same mistake again. Who likes to pay attention to attention but understands it when I sometimes don't. When she's invited to take sides against me, she listens diplomatically, but won't. Who asks me if I like it first, but wears a hat because she likes to wear a hat. And when I compliment her on her choice, she doesn't worry what I mean by that. Who thinks my chicken cutlets are sublime and moves the car when I am too beat to drive, who laughs because she gets I'm being funny and smiles because it's hard to be alive, who'll never want to be a servant or a master, but wants to work together as a team and build over a lifetime love familiar instead of holding out for love supreme. Can you put all that into a machine? The builders smiled. If that's the way you feel, what you want is a woman. What we make are fakes, but most prefer them to the real. Nice, nice. You know, it's interesting that one of the first dystopian films that I, I remember, in the, in, at least in this round, on AI was Ex Machina, which was about, you know, cyborg women. <laughs> that, you know, that's okay. You know, okay. Fiction, but sorry, <laughs> but that's, that's what they do. And, you know, it's a money maker. Yeah. Of course they do. How, how, did, too, right? how did that work out? <laughs> How does <Yeah>. that work? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of X Mac, and I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it is. But anyway, as you can see, I'm not, I'm not advocating that people should rush right out and start building artificial women uh, at all. But uh, I think it kind of says what my attitude is. Well, there are a lot of people that are <laughs> suggesting it, so. <coughs> oh, really? Oh, writing, I mean, yeah, not suggesting, but suggesting that this is the thing. Well, that's that sounds like the kind of human cop-out I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's too oh. bad, but hey, that's, that's where we are. Um, 
I'm sure some enterprising woman scientist can devise an artificial male if that hasn't already been done. <laughs> Probably easier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it only needs three gears. <laughs> <laughs> We're far less complex. And, and no reverse. <laughs> All right, this is deteriorating. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, let me wrap things up. But before I do, because Claudia mentioned the, uh, the, the course that she teaches, I want to share the screen of the poster which announces that, uh, that course. Can you see it? Not yet. <laughs> ah, there, it is. there it is. Yeah. So this, this was for the, uh, the conference at National Academy of Sciences in 2019. Um, uh, the course was already going on at that time. It was in uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, April, actually, it was an April conference. So yeah. Um, well, there are a lot of interesting things um, talked about here. Poetry activating the whole brain, meter and rhyme freeing the subconscious. That's, I'd like to hear more about that. And metaphor is a foundation yeah. for learning. Uh, yeah. There's, it's, uh, uh, I'm sure you can get started on those questions in a course, but, um, you know, what a huge, we, we could have yeah. made this conversation in, you know, really into just a discussion of these things as topics yeah. but yeah. but it's uh, this is about yeah. being being poets but but still it, it's fascinating and and i hope you get to do more with it thank you thank you al yeah it's uh the course is actually going on uh at the the writer's center now under a different name uh whole brain poetry okay uh, okay and, yeah yeah and uh <laughs> yeah it, it's just kind of i i give i give out a copy of this uh, and say you can hold me to this. You know, th this is sort of a checklist. And if you found if you find we haven't covered any of these topics, let me know. <laughs> um, nice. The, yeah, and um, the uh, acknowledgments at the bottom. Uh, I I would definitely add to those now. Um, um, there are some poets I know who I didn't know I did not know had uh, written about uh, aspects of this before, uh, such as Julie Kane and Amit Majmadar, and um, yeah. And, and of course, Rick Mullen took part in the uh, uh, conference panel at, at Westchester on poetry and science. No, it's just- Well, very... and his name appears here. That's right. So there, so there you go. All right, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna stop the share. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. And yeah, this was, uh, this, uh, as usual, it piques your curiosity and, and it, it uh, poses a lot of questions that we're not able to answer. But um, certainly it, it's given me a lot of things to, to go on and look up and ponder about. And uh, the main thing that I wanted to demonstrate was how many different ways you could incorporate a scientific sensibility of one kind or another into your own work as as a poet and uh, this we're just scratching the surface but you know the the discipline goes on so uh keep your eyes and ears open so thank you very much i'm going to conclude the proceedings and uh...